put a bunch of books. Sorry about that. Sorry, that's okay. <laughs> um, there we go. Uh, so I read a bunch of books about screenwriting to structure the book in a way that would look familiar to Hollywood producers and such. So I wasn't surprised that it was picked up. Uh, that said, you know, I couldn't have asked for a better uh, family. The Coppola family of Godfather, the Godfather fame uh, created the TV show. So I really couldn't have been in better hands. And as for most Americans think they have a book in them, my father was a history professor and, and uh, author. Uh, I mean, there, there's a bookshelf full of books about this long that he had written over the course of his career. He had four words about, if you have a book in, in you, and those four words are, apply ass to chair. Just sit down and do it. Don't wait for I inspiration. I see. Um, speaking of fathers, actually, my my own father's here. Uh, <laughs> if anyone wants to say hi to my dad, he's Arnold Conheim in the chat. Um, hi. The first time he's joining one of my chats. Um, I do have to give a shout out for my because my dad put me on. Um, he gave me his instrument. He played the trumpet. I played the trumpet in fifth and seventh, eighth and ninth grade. And then I switched to French horn, which is a more obscure instrument. You I'm not sure. Do you consider you're lucky that you you started with one of the more obscure instruments at the start of your career rather than take it on later. I think that everyone starts with clarinet, trumpet, flute, and saxophone, and then like they fill out the other instruments later on. In a way, I feel for I feel fortunate and unfortunate. <laughs> fortunate in that it is an unusual instrument. I'm from a university town in North Carolina, and there were very few oboists around. I wasn't even old enough to qualify for the Allstate Orchestra, but they only had one other person apply in the whole state. So they just let me have the other chair uh, when I was 13 or 14. Um, so in that way, I feel fortunate. Um, however, when they handed out band instruments in the sixth grade, so I was 11, uh, they did it in alphabetical order and I was third from the end. So all that was left by the time they got to me were oboes and bassoons. The bassoon was way too big for a little girl to handle on a bike. So I chose the oboe. <laughs> I see. Um, well, there's also a thing of, I, I find personally that whenever I hear of a French, a person who played French horn, I have like a weird special bond, like, oh, you play that instrument. Um, when you're talking about like championing music, do you champion that instrument or do you just champion classical music as a whole? Oh, just classical music as a whole. Um, really I bought, you, you don't really have a special bond with other oboists. Well, I guess we do. You know, we all live in this um, torture of making reeds. So we have this shared angst. Um, so we do. I mean, it's kind of a brotherhood, sisterhood thing for sure. And bassoonists, their reeds last a little bit longer in general. So even though they're tortured too, I think we are times 10. <laughs> I see. Um, I, um, I see. So your book, you, you, it's a very juicy book. Um, I mean, there's a very juicy love life. There's a very attractive bohemian lifestyle. At one point you describe a party littered with Mozart sheet music, Kung Pao chicken, and everyone's smoking a joint or something. Um, what, it's very attractive, but it's also like very juicy. Was there anything you felt was was there any lines where it said, I'm not going to put this escapade I had in the book, or is it just all out there? No, it's, it's really all out there. Um, the book wasn't ever meant to be a memoir. It was meant to be a dissection of how classical music was funded and developed in the United States. Um, and the thing, while people often say classical music is on the decline, that's simply not true. It wasn't really a way in which to make a full-time living until the late 50s, early 60s. And the one factoid that led me to, to write the book was that there was no full-time orchestra in America until 1964. So it was really fairly recent that this came about. So classical music is actually doing quite well. But in order to make the book more readable, I thought I would parallel certain parts of this history that I wanted to write with a memoir so you could see what it looked like from the inside out. Yeah, that, that is interesting. You do talk about that. Um, when you talk about, yeah, you also, um, 
I mean, it's also interesting to note that I, you, meant, you, you physically name checked uh, a couple people that I, I've heard of. Um, I did once see a concert of the Boston Pops and I remember the name Keith Lockhart. Um, were you scared to put the name in there or how do you go about deciding exactly who to put in and who to name first and last name and things like that when you made the book? Okay, so there are 12 pseudonyms in the book they are listed on the copyright page. So the book was vetted by an attorney and it just makes it a lot more believable if you use people's real names. And frankly, 95% of the people in the book were represented positively. Yeah. I certainly was not my intention to hurt anybody. Um, so the lawyer pointed out where there could be legal issues with certain things. And those are the things that ended up as pseudonyms. So if somebody turns up and says, oh, um, you know, I resemble this character in the book. I play the viola. I'm, you know, I have black hair and blue eyes. Um, but that's, you know, the, the name is, and the name is the same. If it's a pseudonym, then obviously it's not the same person. So this is, this is commonly done with memoirs. Well, it's also probably important because you, you do highlight some of the dark things that happened at, say, the North Carolina School of Arts where you got your training. Um, there was all sorts of manners of sexual abuse, and even it sounded like one of your male classmates got roofied and raped from one of the descriptions. Yes. Um, it said that some of your teachers retired before the book was published. Was was any of this, did, was there, was there even more kind of vetting of how things occur in the aftermath of the book, do you believe, or? By vetting, what do you mean? Do you think the North Carolina School of Arts um, looked at that and looked at that book in that environment, looked at when the book came out, did they say, well, we really needed to, to change the way we do things? No, but I, I can tell you this because it's been in the press and it's been in the New York Times. There is a current active lawsuit uh, against the North Carolina School of the Arts for sexual abuse from something like 60 something students. So I think they're really, you know, on their toes now. I see, yeah. Um, and then you also, well, and then some of it is also, yeah, it does sound like, I mean, and do you think uh, the world of classical music is more of a meritocracy than when it was when you were there? Yes, I really do. I mean, there's always networking, but the thing is, if you can't hold up your end of the bargain and really do the job, then you're not going to continue working. I mean, yes, you might get a few gigs through the old boys, old girls network, but if you can't keep the ball in the air, it's not going to last. You have to produce. Music, I mean. <laughs> hold on, hold on just a second. I have someone who, who's been eager to come to this meeting for a long time and I want to okay. see a Zoom link. Uh, if anyone else has a question, feel free to um, chime in. Hi, I have a question actually. Um, so I actually put in the chat, my name is Yasmin. Um, I'm curious about whether for most people, sort of the instrument that they fall into is just coincidence or happenstance. Um, I'm just kind of curious about that because I'm a mom and you know, I, I noticed my son, you know, tapping with pencils on the table and he said, all right, let's try drums, you know, but I, I don't know, like, was that just, is that how it usually is for people? Well, it happens, that's a really good question. It happens in a lot of different ways. Often it is something like my case where it's alphabetical order. Another way that often occurs is that there's a violin in the attic <laughs> that your grandfather played you know, long ago. So you've got a free instrument, so there you go. Um, and my, I'm from Chapel Hill, North Carolina, and we did not have a string program in the schools. So there was a youth orchestra, but there were probably from sixth to 12th grade, there were probably only about 11 or 12 string players in town altogether. So, you know, it was really, you were kind of stuck with wind instruments. I did play the piano first from the age of five. So, which I didn't, you know, I was, I was 
my um, idea of practicing was staring out the window at the dog. Um, so I wasn't a great piano student. But I think, you know, it's very rare that somebody really has a, a passion for something or sees somebody playing cello or such and then wants to do it. But it, I do have friends who chose instruments for that reason. Uh, it's very true. But a lot of us ended up, you know, like I did, just end of the alphabet. And there you yeah. go. <laughs> do you think you could have been equally successful in anything? In other words, was like your connection to music and classical music, or was it in particular to that instrument that led, you know what I mean? Um, I think it was the instrument in particular. Uh, if I had ended up with a flute, flute is so incredibly um, competitive. So there were my goodness, in my junior high school band, there must have been 20 flutes, you know, and there were two oboes, which was actually a lot. <laughs> um, so it's, I mean, if you're an orchestra personnel manager and there's a principal flute audition, you are just going to be awash in resumes. They, you know, thousands of people may apply for a flute job, whereas maybe only 300 oboists would apply. All right. So I was also asked, so moving on, I'm, I'm trying to kind of give people, I'm trying to ask questions in chronological order. So after North Carolina School of Arts, you went to the Manhattan School of Music, you also got into Juilliard. Um, you described a really interesting environment of the Manhattan School of Music, where a lot of the people didn't have anything interesting to do or say outside of like technical music. And then you went to Columbia, where people were able to, when you went to party with them, they were able to talk about literature and art and all kinds of a broad range of things. Was that intended as a um, indictment of sort of the musical conservancy culture? Well, uh, remember, I went to the North Carolina School of the Arts from the ages of 15 to 18 when you're in high school. And we had to satisfy the state requirements for high school graduation, which consisted, I think, of something like one English course a year, geometry, a semester of biology and algebra. I think that was it. So I was finished with every, and there was nothing else available. There were so few high school students there. So we really didn't get a well-rounded education. We, almost all of us bombed the SAT. I did have one friend who had a car and he went over to Wake Forest University, which was on the other side of town and took college courses on his own. He, you know, he was from a very kind of, uh, what do you call it? Just a very, uh, kind of moneyed Southern family, old money. And so they had an idea of the value of education. So because of that, you know, all we really had to talk about, because we were only taking music classes for the most part, theory, sight singing, solfege, dictation, stuff like that, music history. Yeah, we all, all the high school students had to take music history. And when I went to Columbia, I was in my late thirties when I went to Columbia, it was a, a program for, um, post-baccalaureate students who needed to satisfy certain requirements to uh, either be able to do well on the GRE test for graduate school or qualify for medical school or something like that. So I didn't party at all with those people. It was, it was daytime courses pretty much and I went off and played the show at night. Um, so I, it's just that the classes I took, uh, you know, I took chemistry and um, calculus philosophy, political science, economics. It was just fantastic to be exposed to all of these different disciplines and be able to talk in, you know, most of the talking I did with other students was in class. And because I, I am from the South, I was born in 1960. I'm, you know, unfortunately, I do have memories of segregation and the separate water fountains and everything. So that came up in philosophy class one day and the teacher who was a, you know, a teaching assistant, so mid, 20s probably, and I was maybe 38, uh, started asking some questions and saying, you know, did you know it was this way? And I said, well, yes, I was, I was there. I lived through it. And all the students turned around and looked at me like I was a total dinosaur. <laughs> um, so, you know, that was interesting. Also, my first experience with, oh my God, I am getting older. <laughs> I see. All right. Um, yeah, so at... Um... Well, then you also talked about, I think one of my favorite anecdotes of you <clears throat> when you were in the professional world was when you talked about you were doing scores. You did a movie for Wendy Malick. 
your phone. Oh, yeah. The movie for the well, Wendy Malik. Wendy Malik played an oboist um, yes. who was having an affair with a married man. You at the time were having an affair with a married man who was sitting right next to you, also playing the oboe. Yes. Did you find the experience really ironic when it was happening? Yeah, because I think he also had an affair with Wendy Malik. <laughs> did Wendy Malik ever read the book, or did anyone ever? Did either him or Wendy Malik? Do you have no anything? I, I mean, I I never saw her again after that uh, scoring session, so I I don't really know. I was also curious because I never really understood um, when you were talking about scoring and you say that there's an orchestra in the room. Did you mean that there's like all 110 pieces in every orchestra session that you're in? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the question. I didn't understand necessarily. Um, <clears throat> I guess I didn't understand what what it means when an orchestra is in the room. Like the one the one visual scene I couldn't place was um, what the what it looked like when a move when you were in a movie when you were scoring a movie oh okay so you're um so one good example was that i can think of was i did um uh one version of twilight and elmer Berns bernstein scored it so we're all sitting in the room actually that's not a good example because he didn't use a click track but say rca studios we recorded malcolm x there and so we all sit in the room, you have headphones and generally people, because you hear a click to make it, make sure it syncs directly with the, with the movie. Uh, so you start and end at the right time. Um, so the usual, sometimes you can see a monitor, the conductor who's usually the composer has to see the monitor. So he's conducting you and you get, uh, say it's a piece in four, four, you get two measures of four, four. So you get eight clicks. Generally people put the headset on, or cans as we call them, one ear and leave, it, leave the other side off so that you can hear acoustically around you. So you can, you can watch, sometimes you are able to watch the movie, sometimes you're not, but the conductor is always watching it while he's conducting you. So that's, and everybody's in the room together, except for something that's loud that might bleed into other microphones like drums. They have isolation booths for those people, but, but they can still hear you and the click through the cans. <clears throat> and you also mentioned that the director at that time was, at that point was uh, Gwyneth Paltrow's father, Bruce, was in the room with you. And I was curious well, about why a director would need to be there if he, if he wasn't an expert on music and how that all oh, happened. So he's in the recording booth. Um, but you know, if, if the music isn't working out sometimes, so for example, for Malcolm X, I ended up being the solo instrument for the assassination scene where Malcolm X dies. And uh, Spike was there, Spike Lee was there that day in the booth and he, he didn't like what had been written. So the composer, Terrence Blanchard, while we went out to lunch, wrote a whole new um, cue. We came back from lunch and they decided whether it should be violin or oboe and they liked to oboe better. Spike chose the oboe, so we ended up with that. So something like, you know, for occasions like that. So the director's not always there, but it's there at times. And um, you also mentioned that score, the score goes, um, this, that in the 1980s, they weren't using score uh, instruments for the scores as much. Is that still a downward slide? Because I was thinking maybe the 80s is the 80s and because that was more of like a synthesizer heavy generation. And maybe like today they are using orchestras. Well, yes and no. So I think I, I may be a year or two off, but um, around 1984 is when the Mac Plus came out and it was able to sample instruments and fairly realistically replicate the sound of acoustic instruments like mine. Um, so that was before that happened, it had to be all acoustic instruments and some occasionally a synthesizer was part of it, but hardly ever for a whole score. So after that though, uh, these computers were really able to sample and replicate instruments quite well. However, for, for big, you know, thriller action movies, Star Wars, that sort of thing, John Williams movies out here in Los Angeles where I live now, um, they still hire enormous orchestras for that. 
I mean, they'll, they'll hire an 80 piece orchestra. So, and every month in the union paper, they, you know, they choose one recording session and print everybody's names and then everybody who wasn't on the date gets all jealous. <laughs> yeah, all right. Um, let me see what else I have. So I, when you did the, um, so I guess, so moving towards um, the TV show that you did, um, the character was, <laughs> I would say that, I mean, there were changes. Did you have different goals with what you wanted to do with the TV show or was it largely out of your hands? It was mostly out of my hands and, you know, what good hands it was in. I mean, Coppola's are great. Plus there was this wonderful, the four creators were Roman Coppola, who's Francis Ford's son and uh, Jason Schwartzman, who's Roman's cut first cousin. Uh, this uh, Paul Weitz, who's a very much acclaimed director and Alex Timbers, who's sort of a Broadway wunderkind. I mean, he he uh, writes things, he directs things. He's just terrific. He wrote the pilot script on which I had to sign off and I loved it. You know, I just, I didn't have any problem with anything in the whole film. And I was really happy they chose uh, Lola Kirk, the actress who plays me. I thought she was terrific and she's adorable. And I was afraid they were gonna She's somebody like the nerd on The Big Bang Theory who's doing Jeopardy now because <laughs> it's such a nerdy instrument. But, I mean, it's uh, it's actually it's uncanny and, and it wasn't on purpose, but Lola's mannerisms, even the way she puts the instrument together, she can play it a little bit, um, just or just like mine. I don't know. It's like we were separated at birth or something. Yeah. Um the when a when a book is when a season when a book is based on a story um sorry when a when a tv show is based on a book it seems that the first season they kind of stick close to the book and then they have to kind of create new storylines like the person in this case the person has romances with the conductor or the person decides to get into conducting or Lola character's character decides to get into conducting and then the orchestra enters new negotiations and all kinds of things were you concerned about anything that would happen if it went past a season or two, or if it if the show would have run too long and would have veered so far away from your story? Well, th there was a fifth season plotted out, but um, the you know the Me Too thing out here in Hollywood with sexual harassment and all. Apparently, the chief of Amazon Studios was uh, caught up in that somehow, which surprised me. But what do I know? And so he resigned abruptly. The new Amazon Studios chief came in and wanted to dump all the little niche shows like ours and concentrate on things like Lord of the Rings. So that's what she did. And so we were canceled. And actually I think everyone breathed a sigh of relief because I think we were running out of material. I mean, 40 episodes is a lot already. Yeah. And they covered a lot of things. However, the, from the beginning, uh, there was a plot line that wasn't in my book at all. And the reason for that, it was the two conductors, the outgoing conductor and the star of the show, the Mexican actor, Gael Garcia Bernal, who is Rodrigo de Souza. And um, <clears throat> they really wanted to get, I think the saleability of the show really focused on the saleability of Gael and his career. So when they finally landed him, I think they wrote that storyline in because it, it, it was very attractive to him, I'm sure. And that's how that developed. But aside from that, there were a lot of scenes taken directly from the book. Um, you know, the book was never meant to be primarily a memoir. I just stuck the memoir in to make it a little more interesting or readable because I, I just, you know, I didn't want to sell three copies and leave it at that. Which scenes were lifted? I'm trying to remember. I Oh, gosh. Um, there was a, you know, the whole labor strike thing. Um, there was a paragraph from the book about sexual styles of different instruments, <laughs> instrumentalists that was in there. Uh, the chamber music party where they did the spin the bottle game. And God, I wish I knew where that prop was. I would love to have it. Uh, <laughs> um, there were just a bunch of things that were, were taken directly, but the storyline of uh, the conductor and the oboist wasn't really a thing. And the two dueling conductors was not really a thing either. So 
um, a lot of it was taken from the book, but I, after a point, because it, it wasn't, the book wasn't meant to be a memoir story. It was meant to be this um, examination of the developments of the arts after the Cold War era in America. It might also probably have been, I, was it realistic to see conductors fighting or having this uh, two alpha male conductors? I don't, I think if, after all this time, I still have no idea why conductors matter that much if you can play without people waving their arms, but. Yeah, none of us do either. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think that I actually kind of interpreted when I did interview two uh, string players, which got your attention in the first place, that I think the, the movie, the TV show was a love letter between the conductor and like the whole orchestra. Yeah, definitely. There's, and it's I, like a, it's like a, a group bond of like 110 people or however many were in an orchestra. Right. And there, there are some conductors. I mean, when I started and was playing in the New York Philharmonic, uh, you know, we saw a lot of uh, East uh, conductors from Europe who had defected from uh, behind the Iron Curtain, and they were very much tyrants and not used to seeing women in the orchestra, so that was interesting. But now we have people like um, of the character that Gael plays, Rodrigo, and one that, that I can think of, somebody I really loved working with um, in the San Francisco Symphony was David Robertson. I don't know if you've heard of him, but he's just, I call him a prince among conductors. He's just really trusts the musicians. So they trust him back and they give him what he wants and more. And he's a great conductor too. I mean, so. But. And then you, so um, lastly, and then I'll just ask if other people have questions. Um, the, um, you talked about how well, you've talked to various points about how sometimes you felt your peers or that orchestras got entitled. You quoted a certain sociologist, um, let me see if I have it here, who said that there was a, um, Paul DiMaggio said there's the illusion of sanctity, um, that orchestras, be, they, get, they were isolated from economics because they have grants. Um, Aren't grants kind of a good thing, though? Didn't do? You, are you for or against musicians leaning on leaning on music for full time work? I think that perhaps it makes them better. Well, if it can be supported, I mean, one of the one of the main theses of the book was that the whole development of the rise of the arts in America started in 1956 when the Ford Foundation started um, issuing matching grants. So for every $100 given, the Ford Foundation also made a donation. And they cut that out in the 80s. And orchestras at this point and chamber series and all sorts of things were accustomed to having twice as much money as they actually had. So it was a bit of shock. And things started, I mean, collapsing because they couldn't support themselves. And it's sort of stabilized now. A couple of years ago, there, were, there was just a rash of uh, orchestras going under and having to reorganize and being out of work for a couple of years. But I, I did call it the culture of entitlement. Because, um, I mean, a lot of us were scrambling, like before I was playing in the Philharmonic, for example, I really was scrambling for work. And it was rough. And also, the idea of grants, there's actually very, very little government support for the arts. It's largely private funding. So, I mean, the NA, N, NEA, I almost said NRA, NEA does quite a bit for classical music, but it's really a drop in the bucket. They just hardly have a budget at all. But, um, you know, if you're if you're in a major orchestra, you do work very hard. I mean, I'm, I have a, many friends in the Metropolitan Opera Orchestra. Some of those operas are six hours long. If you're a French horn player, that's that's a beating. I am a French horn player. <clears throat> I know, it's but hard. imagine, you know, a friend of mine is principal horn, Eric Ralski, and I can just imagine, you know, when uh, Gertrude Demerung starts or something, he must be just like, I hope I took my vitamins. <laughs> and then, you know, you don't get home till one or two in the morning. And they, that, so they basically have the equivalent of two orchestras so that, um, well, not entirely, but just so people aren't exhausted and they do get a break. So it is, um, orchestras do work very, very hard. 
but um, also that generally many orchestras get say 10 weeks off in the summer. And although some people after years, I can see how going on tour would be tiring, but you go on an international tour every year and it's, it's fairly luxurious with the Philharmonic, I mean, or San Francisco Symphony or something. Somebody takes care of everything. Your luggage is taken care of. Your instruments are shipped separately. They even have a, a shipping trunk for piccolos. <laughs> I mean, you, can, you don't have to carry anything. So it's a, it's a great job, but it is, I mean, there's a reason they make the big bucks there. You, and you're also in journalism. So what, um, I mean, my art, I think to me, I think I, I see myself as an artist and I see that the, the ability to make art in terms of writing stories in a journalistic style is, seems to be diminishing lately. Do you feel like there needs to be some solution to that as well? I'm not sure what you mean. I think the market for writing stories and selling stories is less than it was five years ago. There's statistics that one third of the newspapers that existed 10 years ago will be out of business by 2025. Well, I would say that and something that started happening when I was in journalism school was that um, chain newspapers started acquiring more and more local newspapers. So that put a lot of individual uh, put a lot of individual journalism out of business because the same chain newspaper will publish the same story in 15 different newspapers, you know, and the New York Times or the, the Tribune in Chicago own a certain number of newspapers. So whereas each newspaper used to have a staff that wrote only for them, now it's uh, shared by many papers. So that's fewer journalists who are needed. Okay. Um, I, so someone, so I had my, okay, I just, <clears throat> we can turn it over to other people. Does anyone have any other questions? I guess raise your hand if you got questions. Um, and anyone is welcome to ask questions. Um, Samantha is here and a, she's one person who asked me and a few other people asked me like, how do you interview a famous person? And I guess I was just curious. I'm not asking everyone on the call to bug you after the call, but what is the, now that you have a lot of fame and stuff, what is the best way to get your attention? Um, and how do you sort of like divide your time between what, whoever's trying to get in touch with you, like journalists and other people and? Oh, well, um, I think there's a link on my website, which is blairtendle.com. Um, and second, I'm famous. I don't feel famous, but <laughs> um, let's see. Anyway, uh, and also Facebook. Uh, a lot of people have gotten through to me on Facebook. You mean they just message you out of the blue on Facebook? Yes. Interesting. Yeah. I got off of Twitter because it, it just sort of seems like a, this just endless unpleasant place, it, just in general, whereas Facebook is a little more personal. And then I, I don't really have anything else. You know, locally I'm on nextdoor.com because we just bought a house in a new neighborhood we moved in yesterday, two days ago. Um, so that's been helpful for, you know, who's a good maid, where do you buy appliances, things like that. Does anyone else have any questions? You could raise your hand or, uh, Emily, do you have a question? Just unmute your microphone. My dad has a question. So oh. one of you just needs to know how to unmute a microphone and then you can, you can enjoy the privilege. Uh, of oh, okay. No, I think I... Uh-oh. I mean, my dad is... Emily, if my dad can figure out how to unmute a microphone faster than you, I would be ashamed because, I mean, he's not really a technology person, so... No, I mean, I know, <laughs> I know how to unmute the microphone. I just, uh, I'm at Starbucks, so I was a little cognizant about the music and the blenders and things. <laughs> I just didn't want it to be. Can, can I be heard? Or? Yeah, you can. You are heard. Okay. Um, well, Blair, thank you so much for uh, like. Yeah, your your answers are super interesting. And uh, admittedly, I have not read your book. I just found out about this event, and I was like over the moon excited because it's <laughs> one of my favorite sh like shows on any of the networks, and uh, I've recommended it to so many people, but. 
it is more of like an indie show. Uh, I guess my question is, um, when you were talking about the various directors and the people that were uh, like kind of the creators and how they kept in integrity with your original story and you were pleased about that. My question would be uh, like, how, how much involvement were you in the actual creation? Like, were you on set a good amount? Uh, did they consult you regularly? Um, did you kind of meet with, I'm forgetting her name, you mentioned it, but the actress that played you, like Highland, I guess, Highly, right? Highly. Uh, Highly, I, I know, I was like saying it the way. Um, but yeah, uh, did you like kind of train her in your mannerisms? You were talking about no. how she mimicked you or. No, Lola's just natural disposition is a lot like mine. So, you know, and she's very giggly and silly. Um, no, I didn't. I mean, I, I was on set quite a bit, but, you know, I moved to LA because I did have to get the heck out of town because I used everybody's real names. And then I came to LA because I thought, well, maybe it'll, you know, be, be filmed into a feature or a TV show. Of course, then it was completely filmed in New York. <laughs> so I, I did go to New York every year and was on set a little bit, but they didn't really need, they had a whole research team. And I think I would have gotten in the way quite a bit because I would have, you know, just nitpicked stuff that didn't need nitpicking. So because it's not a documentary, it doesn't need to be real. Um, it's in, it's just entertainment. So, you know, I kept cracking up when the, you know, there was this never ending series of stories about how it wasn't authentic. And, you know, it's not supposed to be authentic. It's, it's entertainment. It's supposed to be comedy. It's fun. And actually most of it really was authentic. You know, people would say, you know, why, uh, how could you possibly say somebody went from a, an afternoon concert to an evening Broadway show? And I'm like, I did that twice a week for 15 years. <laughs> so yes, that's realistic. You know, and all these people who are sort of armchair quarterbacking uh, us don't realize what it, that it really is like that. A lot of the times, of course, nobody would actually be making reads in a in a bicycle cab, but that was absolutely hilarious. I mean, I I really like that a lot, and I so everybody on this on the, among the stars who played an instrument or conducted had a weekly lesson with somebody and prominent people. I mean, really good people like the conducting coach was Ransom Wilson. So you know, I'm constantly hearing seeing online. I mean, I just laugh at it now. It bothered me at first, but now it doesn't. Oh, somebody, couldn't somebody show the conductor how to beat a 4-4 four, four pattern? And I'm like, couldn't somebody have showed Leonard Bernstein how to 